Okay, let's see who's on. Let's make sure this is all working properly. Good, good. We're on Twitch. Just going to make sure that uh, YouTube's kicking in. Let's see. All right, cool. Looks like we're live on uh, YouTube and we're live on Twitch. Just wanted to make sure I can see what you guys are seeing. Great. Um, I'm gonna try to fix this. What's happening in in uh, my my browser? Cause it's it's doing some weird stuff. I don't know if it's my graphics cards or what. Um, but it's doing some weird stuff streaming. Oh, there it goes. Looks like it's... I think we got it to work. We'll see. Let me know if there's issues um, in there. So, we're just going to roll with it. I'm going to make sure, it's again, it's working on here. I'm going to check my phone. Yeah, it's a, it's a little buggy. Hopefully, this, hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. If not, this will be a failed stream, and we'll just try again once I get the bugs fixed out, fi all fixed. So if you guys are um, just dropping in, though, say hi. Love to see who's who's in the chat if you're joining us. So today, basically, I wanted to talk about Redshift and talk about why I love it so much and um, I know there's a lot of Octane users I'm an Octane user myself as well but I've been using Redshift a lot more and um, I kind of want to show you I've had some people well I've seen some people in the Redshift community asking questions about how to use it so um, we're just going to kind of jump in and start talking about the setup so um, Redshift you know comes in and it's a GPU based render engine but um, it for me, I've just had some really clean results um, uh, with my like volumes and stuff. So I wanted to show you some of that. So anyway, um, this is the basic. You know, I just always drag my plugins off and just drop it right here. It's really easy. If you go into your settings, we can just set it all up in here. Make sure you're always switched to Redshift and. I can go through these settings really quickly on what I use. So IPR mode is basically previewing it. It's like live previewing. It doesn't stop render. If you turn this off, it will do a live. It'll do a normal render and you have to wait for it. This is nice when you're just getting things set up. Um, something I learned from some other tutorials is always turning on this if you're doing animation, which 90% of the time I am, because that's really helpful for uh, your noise patterns and the way things get broken up in there. So that's something I always turn on. Um, let's see, are, is any, are any of these dialogues popping up? I hope so. Um, so uh, another thing I like or that I use so overrides, th this is super nice when you're figuring out if you're getting like lots of noise or lots of flickers you can go in here override the samples you can either replace them or scale them and uh, scaling it is typically what I do and basically you're just like timesing it so if I did two it'd be timesing my reflection um, samples by two so that's helpful if you're trying to figure out what is creating all the noise and um, seeing if it's not working properly motion blur pretty straightforward we can just turn this on make sure if you're doing deformations, you can turn that on. We'll come back to that. Environment, we'll get back to that. Lens, um, how much other goodies. So AOVs, these are also known as 
Um, multi passes. Some people don't realize that AOVs are multi passes if you're kind of jumping in between different render engines. So AOVs, these are are our multi passes, and the way you use them is you enable them, and it's going to ask you how many, and you can just keep adding multi passes. And then in here, you just click, and there's a whole bunch. So you can choose your multi pass, and you want to always make sure that you are turning it on to a multi pass um, output format. So 8-bit, 1632. And you can do multi-part EXR, which is what I would suggest. Three, if you're using, you know, 32-bit float, there you go. Um, you don't have to have compression on. And yeah, so that's AOVs, multi-passes. That's how you do that. And if you want less, or if you just want it off, just disable it. Um, so we'll get into some of this, but this is obviously, if you have teeny hairs and you want to get those fine details you can turn on the um, hair min pixel width so it can trace those that's as far as I know I usually don't touch a lot of this stuff because I don't quite understand all of this and um, I don't know if this windows popping up so I'm gonna try to fix this really quickly in OBS yeah it's not showing up so let's just add a Let's try to capture just the dis my display capture. What do you say we do that? Whoa, now you guys can see everything. That's crazy. Um, but I think this is going to do better. So I'll just hide this. So it's going to be a little confusing, but I'm going to hide my OBS, and you guys can see everything that's going on in my chat. But that's okay. We just need you guys to be able to see um what's happening because i just realized i pulled up all this stuff and i don't think you were able to see any of it <coughs> so i may want to start over <laughs> who do we have uh hey how's it going on youtube we have yosef hey dude <laughs> i know i can just say it to him but sometimes it's fun to just chat let me know if um you're seeing problems in here yosef if if you can't see my screen properly. This is my first time doing a stream on YouTube and Twitch. Eventually I'll get this down. It's kind of confusing. I don't know if any of you guys have done streams, but holy cow, it's confusing. There's like a million things you have to do. I'm watching uh, the stream on my phone. And uh, yeah, it's pretty far behind. So I'm going to start over. I wish I could just stop, but I'm going to start over because I realized you weren't able to see my windows. Or maybe you could. Nope, you guys couldn't. So now you can. All right. So we're going to start over. We're using Redshift. Redshift Render Engine. I put the plugins over here. Our settings. You want to make sure you turn it on to Redshift. And um, then you want to, like I said, turn IPR on. And this is uh, basically the resolution you're going to preview at. So, And if you turn this off, it's going to do just a normal render. So I keep this on when I'm getting things ready. And sometimes you have to turn that off for certain things that, like, I don't know if it's motion blur or something, but you'll need to just play with that. And we'll, we'll play with this. Again, um, I turned on randomized pattern every frame because this is when you do animations, this is going to reduce a lot of noise in your animation. So that's something I turn on. Um, and sample overrides. This is, like I was saying before, if you need to isolate or figure out where all, these, all the noise is coming from, it's really nice because you can pretty much go through here and either replace the samples you have or times them, scale them, and you will see... Um, you can just re-render, re-render, and see what is affecting your noise. Is it the reflections? Is it the refractions? Is it your um, ambient occlusion, your lights, and your or your uh, single scattering, like sub, like uh, SSS, subsurface scattering? Is it volumes? And basically, you can ramp up those um, samples to help you clean up some of the noise in your renders. Motion blur, like I said, I enable it. Um, maybe not for previewing, but when you... I can get near the end of your renders. You want to make sure you enable it. I like to render 
it, it depends on the shot. Sometimes, like if I have something spinning really fast or particles, I like to use the motion blur in a 3D application more than doing it um, in post, like in Nuke or After Effects. I feel like if you try to use real smart motion blur, if you know that plugin in After Effects, mm -hmm. if, if you try to use that, sorry guys, if you try to use that uh, plugin with like small things like particles or things spinning really fast, you're not going to get the same motion blur. For example, if you've ever looked at like tires spinning really fast or a helicopter blade, there's a certain type of motion blur that can only be calculated in 3D space and you can't really get that um, in post. It just doesn't look the same. It look because it doesn't, it basically those plugins use the previous frames and frames, bef you know, after or whatever to figure out what it's supposed to look like. So if you do it in, your application, your 3D application, it's going to look a lot better. So I would just say, um, do that. So yeah, let's uh, say it. You know, use that motion blur. And here, um, environment. We'll get back to that. Lens effects. We'll get back to that. Sorry, I have to. Those of you that saw, heard me talking about this, um, we're getting back into it. And sorry for Yosef for not replying. We are using Redshift. And um, AOVs, these are multi-passes, enabling them. Oops. Uh, you need to change it to multi-part EXR. You can choose the file name. So this is where you you name it. And um, this is different than Octane. So Octane in your multi-passes, you choose the file right here where it's supposed to go. And... Whoa. And when you choose the file um, name, you save it, and then you turn off in your save, you would turn off your multipasses right here in Octane. And here in Redshift, um, you actually use your save your image, save your multipass. So you want to turn it on in here and make sure it's set to your, your multipasses set up. This is where it's going to kick it out. So, yeah. I always name it and I put a location right here just because I'm paranoid. Um, so yeah, the AOVs, these are multi-passes and the way you add more is you just click, 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 click and now you're adding a bunch of new multi-passes and then within here you want to choose which ones you want. So there's ambient occlusion, there's background, there's all of these things and within each of these you want to make sure you're ticking on this. This will be closed so you want to open it, tick right here, enable 32-bit or whatever you want. And um, you could even, the cool thing is you can even export these out as their own thing. But I just tick it, make sure that's on, because it's gonna be multi-part EXR. And yeah, you have tons of passes in here. So um, have fun going through those. Um, let's see. Sorry guys, let me check. One thing on OBS I just realized. You guys can't see me. There we go. Sorry. We're just, we're figuring this out. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Be patient with me. Um, hey, what's up, uh, Nixta? Sorry to answer your message. How's it going? Welcome to the stream. Um, excited to have you. Ask questions, guys. If you guys have questions as I'm going, please ask questions. I would love to answer um, what I can. So, yeah. Just stick around. And I am going to be talking a little bit about the crash course because I've been working on it every day. I know I've, I've gotten a lot of messages asking when it's going to be done. It just is taking a lot longer than anticipated. And I've gone back I don't know how many times and redone stuff because programs updated and <laughs> and I learned new techniques. So I'm like, I'm trying to give you guys the best uh, quality I can. Oh, uh, Nixta, thanks for for hanging out. Sorry you can't stick around. It'd been great to have you. Hey, I'm guessing that's how you say Nixta. I don't know. All right, dude. Have a good night. Um, thanks for dropping by. <coughs> Maybe I'll post this after, and you can watch it and uh, learn some things about Redshift because I love it. Um, okay, let's go into GI. So in GI, this is based, yeah, global illumination, you guys know. And typically I just put the first one, the primary one on brute force, and the second one on uh, irrit, I can't ever say this, point cloud. I just call it point cloud. 
and I have I usually leave this alone. My brute force, I leave that alone. And I turn this down, the samples on the screen radius, because I usually don't think I need to go above eight. And I'm still learning a lot about samples and all that. So, but this is typically what I have. Um, photons. Yeah, we're not going to go crazy into this. We're not going to go crazy into subsurface scattering yet. I'll answer the questions that I can. Um, I typically leave this alone, and I leave that alone. So, oh yeah, and in here, unified sampling. So, eventually we'll get into this, your min and max samples. So right now this is pretty low. So if you're getting a lot of noise just overall in your render, um, you can crank this up, you know, to, let's say your max is like 240. This is, and like that's like 150. That would, I, I usually will mess with those numbers to kind of figure out where a good render is. But for now, let's just jump into, just let's start rendering and let's take a look at Redshift and why it's so cool. A couple reasons why I like it. So first things, um, so the environment, um, let's see, where do I start? Where do I start? Um, let's talk about lights. Let's talk about lights. Okay, so you got your infinite light, point light. Um, so the infinite light is just your typical like distance light. I'm gonna try to speak in terms of octane so that it makes more sense. Um, yeah, I know you guys have been waiting for months for the <laughs> crash course, sorry. Um, I'm just getting your messages. The, the stream is a little delayed. Um, and then you can, let's just see what this is looking like. So here's your preview window. And I'm just gonna stick this next to the render. Oops, let's do it on this window. And we'll hit play or render. Okay, so there's our render. So this is an infinite light, pretty basic. Um, right now it doesn't look very good, but let's um, let's add a dome. So a dome is going to be your an octane world. We're going to call this our HDRI environment. So that's what the dome is. And in this dome environment, um, you can just start finding you can just put in some HDRs or you can do a color or whatever you want. So let's go find a HDR. Let me go into my assets and find something. I actually don't like those ones. Let's go in here. I have a ton of stuff. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, we'll shake this apartment one. Okay. So there you go. So there is... A basic render. Let me see if I can make this window bigger by placing it down here. Maybe that's easy for you guys to see. So there's the render. So one of the things I'm going to show you guys some things that I learned with Octane that I, you know, took me a bit to figure out. Um, I was at work and I kept clicking on this button because I wanted to go to four view. And each time I clicked on a different four view, I got way annoyed because it kept changing views in here. And I was like, no, I want to move the cube with this perspective, but I want to keep this camera angle and it's switching every time I click on one. Well, I realized that I never clicked this. So you want to lock your view by clicking this little lock button. So now if I click on these different views, this four views, it's not going to change on me, which was way annoying. And then I was so happy I figured out how to fix that. So that's how you do that. Um, the other thing cool is you can check out your passes like alpha right now or beauty. Um, you can do freeze frame. Um, let me see what else there is. Take a snapshot, yeah, which I've used to show um, clients like a preview of what they have or what, what we're getting. So yeah, that's that. I'm going to throw a just plane in because sometimes it's nice to see how things interact. So I don't like this infinite light, so we're going to delete it. Oh wait, before I delete it, I want to show you some things you can do. So if you click on your infinite light, some cool things you can do is your shadow softness. So as you see, I turned up my uh, shadow softness and right there, it's uh, cleaning up. And to me, I feel like the noise in here is really, really like clean. And this is super basic. Like if I was to hit render, it would just clean this up completely. So really cool. It does it super quick. Um, and I think it's pretty comparable. I mean, Octane's really fast, but this for the results I get in here, I really, really like this. 
So yeah, you can um, obviously do the same type of things where you change your um, your color, or you can turn it to temperature. So if we want a cooler light or warmer light, right there, that's temperature. Your intensity multiplier is your brightness, so we could turn that down, and that's going to turn our intensity down. So I'm going to delete that, and we're going to look at, let me just throw Redshift camera, standard camera, there we go. And so now you have this Redshift camera, which is awesome. And then here, if you go to your exposure, film settings, this is where your like ISO is. So if we turn this to 200, it's going to, we can brighten things up. Oh, I don't know why it's not updating. Maybe I have to hit refresh. Let's see. Maybe I need to re reset this. That's weird. Now that's embarrassing. Usually that works. It's okay. I'm going to try turning on my um, bokeh, which is your focus. Let's see here. Go into your physical. Um, hmm. Maybe I need to drag this into. Oh, is, is it because I locked it? Yes, it is. It's because I locked it. Whoops. Now let's see if I, I uh, guess you can't lock it if you're trying to change your exposure. Oh, there we go. And my bokeh is on. Let me turn that off. Okay. Man, I'm getting all these calls. Okay, sorry guys. So yeah, let's take a look at this. Um, we can turn our exposure down. Our f stops. That's gonna make it brighter, but we can have like more shallow depth of field. And like I was gonna show you, you can enable your focus um, effects. And this is one of the coolest things about, um, I think about Redshift is it has a really cool bokeh thing. So if we want our cube to be in focus, we can just grab our object and put it into our focus object. So now that's in focus. And um, we did have the f-stop a little too, wait, was it this one? Oh, it must be in our actual film settings. Let me turn my vignette off too. So if we look in our camera, we can change our, where is it? Our f-stop so we can get some depth of field. Let's see. I thought it was in here, but I'm not. It's not this f-stop, but I don't think it was. Well, at any rate, let's uh, go in here and play this. So this is your the radius, and you can turn up the power. I'm gonna make this a little bit brighter because it's kind of. Oh, there we go. Wait. Oh, the power's at zero. So yeah, this is like your depth of field, which is I think it does a really good job. And one of the coolest things about the depth of field in here is you can do some, you can put an image in your bokeh, which is like the coolest thing. So if you want some like in-camera chromatic aberration, you can just go in, let's just grab this image. And what this is going to do is it's going to put that, if I just crank this up, maybe this will help you see. You can see that image is inside of um, our bokeh. So that's you can get chromatic aberration inside the camera, which I think is pretty wicked. It's pretty cool. Hi, uh, WIL or 1LT. Welcome to the stream. So, yeah, you can put an image. So, I can put any image in my bokeh. So, if you create your own, like, um, I don't know if we'll be able to see this. This one's super subtle, so you can't really see it. It was one I was playing with. But any image, uh, maybe we'll just throw this, like, Wait, once distortion. Um, let's try this one. If I crank this up, let's see if we can see it. Yeah, you would be able to see this house image in the bokeh, which is so cool. Or if you have an alpha, a weird alpha. So I'm just gonna throw this one back on. Um, and yeah, you can get some cool, just cool looking stuff. It just looks more organic. And right now it's noisy. I'm telling you, if I hit render, it would just be completely clean. So. 
Um, let me turn the light on. It's getting a little dark. Maybe that's better. Let's see. Yeah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there we have um, the bokeh that we've been messing with in our camera. And I was going to say in here, you can change this to normalize. So right now it's – so when I, when I put the image on, it's making it darker. But if I put unit intensity, it's not going to change. It's going to keep that same brightness we had before but just add it, which is – typically what I think I would do or or if this is changing the color you want to turn on white color some which so your white balance isn't all at whack um let's see we can okay. so now that you've seen kind of what that does it's really cool I'm going to turn this off for now because it's a little distracting and we're going to go back to talking about lights so again, go to lights. Let's take a look at point lights. And again, I think I need to unlock. Wait, unlock. Nope, maybe it was fine with this. This light's probably just super not bright. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's starting to show up. Point lights are um, interesting in here. Oh, do you know what we're going to do, guys? Sorry, I'm all over. We're going to add a material so you guys can see how things are reacting a little bit better. So, yeah, you just can go to Redshift Materials, and they have all these materials, but we're just going to do basic material. And you can just drag that on there, and we'll put, we'll grab a different one for the other one. But yeah, so now you can see a Redshift material on here. Um, anyway, back to the point light. Yes, you can, you can just crank this thing up. And it's just going to be your basic point light. And the nice thing is I feel like um, it plays really well with um, Cinema 4D, like, tools. So, yeah, there's that light, that point light right there. So, yeah, it's just a basic point light. I don't really use point lights as much, I'll be honest. Oh, yeah, and in every single um, parameter, you're going to see this volume tab. If you're trying to get volumetric lights and you and they're not working and you have an environment with scattering but they're still not working which I will show you it's probably because you need to turn the contribu contribution scale so what this means is it's going to contribute to volume so every single light needs to have this on if you want volumetrics right now it's working because we didn't it's not working because we haven't put an environment in yet so just so you know heads up um, with point light you can do softness transparency so you have a lot of control in there um, if you ever do light linking, <coughs> excuse me, light linking linking works with this as well. Light linking is basically saying, if we go to the project, we can say, hey, what objects um, do we want to, what do we want this the light to see? So if I wanted to exclude my cube, now this point light, it's going to work on the ground but it's not gonna it's not gonna cast shadows from the uh cube it's not it's excluding the cube so it'll or it's not even casting light on direct light on it i think it gets secondary bounce yeah or that's just that's just reflections from the floor but if i took this out let's see see now we have the light hitting it so if you're ever doing if you ever want to light a specific part of a ground or an object um, this is, that's called light linking. You go into your light, it'll say project. You can include or exclude. If I wanted to exclude my cube like that, and right there, that's actually not light hitting. That's the reflections from the ground being illuminated, if that makes sense. Again, ask questions if you have questions. So, um, that's your point light. You can change color. You can do all that fun stuff. Let's, uh, move on. So now we have lights. Let's go into... Area lights, which are my favorite lights, which I think they're everyone's favorite lights because they're nice and they're soft. They look good. So um, a little technique that I'm actually going to share with you that I talk about in the course about um, about lighting scenes with HDRs is one thing I like to do is try to line up my lights, like put in physical area lights lined up to where um, 
windows are on my HDR. So if I see there's windows right here, I may try to add a huge soft area light to accentuate that environment. So, and the reason why is because you get you get shadows. Like you're you're gonna get proper shadows. So if I turn this up, let me turn that. Whoa, that was way too much. So yeah, now now you're kind of you want to line lights up um, where they would would exist in your environment. So that's just like a little tip. Let me turn down my exposure to see. Let's see what's if I can see my environment a little better. Yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm you'd want to obviously back this up, but now you're able to get a more realistic. Um, lighting situation environment if you are using like area lights on top of um, an HDR so yeah area lights they're pretty basic they're your favorite you can change the temperature of them of course warmer cooler or you can put a image in there um, again ask questions guys if you have questions you can change the disk so it works it plays very well with um, with Cinema 4D's um, lights. So yeah, you can just choose disk, mesh, whatever, and it works. It's great. Again, volumetrics, if you wanna make sure they're volumetric, we can do that. Which I say, um, should we just move to that and just kinda show you volumetrics because it's something cool and we all love volumetrics. Why not? Okay, so right now, you cannot see um, the volumetrics because we need an environment so you want to add an environment and it's going to have some scattering but see as i turn this up nothing is happening and when i first opened this i was like what the crap this is dumb it doesn't even work and i was really frustrated and then i realized it was me not the program you need to make sure this thing's contributing to the volumetrics so now you can see holy cow it's working it's almost working too good but there you go. Now you have some volumetric lights that work. Or if you were like, you know what, I don't want this to work, but I have this uh, spotlight in my scene. Let's see. Why is that not showing my spotlight? You have a spotlight. Let's see if I, oh, there it is. Beautiful. And then just to show you guys how awesome um, this program is, I'm actually going to close this. And we're going to do a quick render to show you how clean it looks and um, what, what the final render will look like. So if I just rendered the scene, it's going to take, I don't know, I feel like it goes really fast for what it is. And that volumetric, like, look at that. That's so clean. I wish I could zoom in and show you guys. I don't know how good it looks on the stream, but. It is so clean. Yeah, we're getting some noise down here, but I could just bump up my samples a little bit. Um, but that volume, that the volumetrics on this are so, so clean. It's fantastic. So that's really cool. Um, now we have volumetric lights. Oh yeah, and I was gonna show you guys, instead of IPR window, if you do the Redshift render window, you can actually do both IPR and um, hit render and it'll send it off. Um, let's bring this down. Okay, so you just gotta click IPR. And there it is. Now we're back in our IPR window. It looks a little bit different and the cool thing is you can look at your red, green, blue channel, alpha, and you can stop it, you can do whatever. I wanna see if it actually changes views though if I click on this. Yes, yeah, so it does change views and I don't see the lock button, which is interesting. So maybe that's the disadvantage of this. So let's go back to our other window. We're just learning, guys. We're always learning. Okay. Let me lock that window. And let me scale. Actually, refresh, there we go. So now it's stuck to that view. Great. So there we have volumetrics. And uh, if you wanted environment volumetrics, all we would have to do 
is our dome light would just have to contribute as well. And there you go. Obviously that's crazy and way too much, but you can turn your scattering down or your ant um what is it, attenuation or whatever? Attenuation. Turn up our you can also do fog so it's uh it'll have a it'll stop at a certain point. See right now we're in the fog and there it is. So you can create like a fog layer, a hazy layer pretty quickly. Just like that. And you can't see that light anymore casting the spotlight because I think we turned down our normal scattering too much. Or it's not reaching it. Let's see. Let's turn this. Okay. So yeah, that's how if you wanted to get some foggy, crazy foggy look, there you go. And we just want to make sure her see so you'd want this way low. And let's see if we can get that spotlight brighter. Maybe it's just not bright enough. There it is. So if you had some foggy scene like that and you wanted some some uh, interesting like lamps on a night street, you could do something like that. I mean, this is being illuminated by a dome light, so it's we're not going to get that same effect. But yeah. Um, so again, I can just if I don't like this uh, contributing to it, or I want it really low. There you go. Or I just do zero, turn it off. And because we have this on, it's going to throw us off a little bit too. There we go. So yeah, right now it looks noisy in this uh, IPR window, but don't worry, it'll it cleans up really, really nicely. And let's uh, let's keep going. Again, if you guys have questions, chime in. IES lights. Um, you for IES lights, you need to make sure you have an IES file. So let's find an IES file. I did have some issues with finding an IES file that worked properly, so I'm just going to hope that one of these works um, well. And I think you have to really crank it up. So let's just try, like, see it's still not coming through. Whoa. Oh, there we go. Hey, there's my IES light in the volumetrics, in the volumes. Oh, there it is. Let's just rotate this. You can see it. Bam. So you also can get these really cool photorealistic IES lights. They're nice for architecture and pretty much environments like cuz most lights have these lenses on them and that's how you're getting that that look is it's from the lens that's on a light. So um, yeah, it's just a really cool look. I'm trying to see if I can tone back. Typically with IES, you have to crank them, but I use these like on spaceships and stuff too because I think they look cool. Uh, let's make this one blue. Cool, cool. See, and right now I think we have the volumes on, so it's kind of going to be bugging. It's it's going to get a little bit noisier, but this render will be pretty pretty clean when we're done um let me see i'm gonna see if we have any people on there we go just seeing who's hanging out so yeah um next i want to kind of i'm just gonna be going over this really really quickly um now tons of time so i'm going to just talk about the um materials really basic stuff with materials so i'm going to zoom into the object and we're just going to talk about some cool features with Redshift and how to do objects. So um, first things first is I'm actually going to make this cube editable, editable, and then we're going to put an object tag on it just like you would in Octane. So 
when you do displacement on objects in Redshift, you want to make sure that this is on. If this is not on, you cannot do displacement. You just can't. And you can also turn this on, and it will subdivide your object. So um, let's see. I'm trying to see which one does what I'm thinking. So that's if you want to smooth it. But if you don't want to smooth it, you don't have to do that. And now you're getting some nice round corners so it doesn't look as janky. Doesn't look like a perfect cube. Um, so there's other ways to do like smoothing as well, which I want to show you guys. So if you have these hard edges and you want to make it look prettier um, in the, in the uh, material options, so you have the basic material setup in here. You have color. So this is where you have choose your color. Um, you have roughness of color. You have backlighting translucency. This thing's kind of interesting because this can like achieve a fake. Um, the only way I can describe it is like a fake subsurface scattering. Um, it, it does this like. You can see as I turn this up, it's like creating this like, basically whatever's on the dark side, it can make look lighter but it's not real subsurface scattering like if i shine the light through i don't think it would go through and do the proper translucency but it basically does it like a fake subsurface scattering which saves a lot of time so i i actually think this thing's pretty cool um you have your reflections your roughness which everyone loves to put a cool texture on your roughness tech on your um reflections because it looks awesome um you have your IOR, which is like your index in Octane. I'm trying to speak the Octane language so you can understand where I'm coming from. So yeah, that's pretty familiar. Refractions does a great job on uh, refractions. So if we're creating some glassy looking stuff, and look, there's dispersion, so you can get that rainbowy effect. <coughs> and again, you have to mess with your it's linked to your reflections IOR. So you'd need to find out like properties of like glass or whatever you're doing to uh, make it look correct. So let's actually see if we can move our IES light um, in front of. I was going to see if we could get some caustics going through that, like prism. Yeah, so it does a pretty good job on um, glassy looking stuff. Like it does a nice, on the dispersion, it doesn't get too noisy. And maybe we'll just do a quick render to kind of show you uh, what that would look like once we get there. Um, there's, yeah, you can turn on thin walled, which does, you know, I don't know what you'd use that for exactly, but it's there. And let me turn this dispersion higher, maybe lower. Let's see. I kind of liked it lower. It's like splitting all cool. And um, there is the subsurface scattering. So this is where you want to do like your candies and all your goodies and skin and all that fun stuff. And you can change colors of it. There you go. So now we have this like candy looking thing and let's go look at the node graph editor because you guys know that very well in octane so this uses octane's node graph which took me a second to get used to but it's not too bad so this is our material this is um what type of material we're plugging it into and up here you can change it. So right now we're just using the basic material. And the cool thing is, is you can just drag and drop, you know, images in here from your from your folders and plug them in um, really quickly, which is nice. Um, I can just show you that really briefly. So if we wanted, um, let me just find something that will work. Okay, bam. You can just drag images in, connect it, diffuse, color and right now it's not going to do it because we have our 
refractions on, but if I turn this down, you can see there's our color, just like so. So yeah, and you can plug those into anything. It just, you plug it in and it'll ask you what you want to do. Um, I wanted to show you this technique with uh, round edges, like I said, and the way you do it is you have to plug it into the bump. Um, so you do a bump map. Wait, maybe you just do round edges. Type in round edges, round corners. This is a cool little technique. Go out, and the way you find your bump is it's in overall. That took me a little while to find, but go into overall and then bump. And voila, now we have these nice soft um, corners. We don't have those sharp corners. And this is just doing it through the bump, so it's not even doing it with the geometry. We're not even having to subdivide. It's This is super handy if you're uh, also doing uh, objects within objects. So if I duplicated this cube and let's say scaled it and brought it out, let me just show you why this round edge is, is so cool. So if we look at the interaction between the two, it's actually kind of curving this part as well. Not just curving the outside edges, but it's curving those edges right there, which is super handy. So that's something I really, really like about it. Um, I gotta go soon. Um, so I'm gonna be wrapping this up, unfortunately. Um, sorry, it was kind of a short stream. I just kind of, the purpose of the stream is just show you basic things in uh, Redshift with uh, C40. And I'll probably do more of this stuff a bit later. Um, like another day if you guys enjoyed this and uh let's see yeah so there's I'm gonna, I'm gonna do another stream talking more about materials and i'll do an actual object um and we'll i want to get into questions and everything but i think this um was kind of helpful for you guys to kind of see how cool redshift is i think more of us should be using it now that it's out and it's super powerful and before in this, I just want to do like a rendered frame to show you guys how well this this cleans up. Because I'll be honest, that was some of my issues I had with Octane is the more and more things I threw at it, the more and more noisy it got. And I feel like it didn't, it, the final renders never cleaned up the way I wanted. I was, I feel like I don't, I would have to really, really wait a long time because um, it would just keep trying to, get it there and I, I just couldn't get the results I wanted and I would rather have a clean render at the end rather than my IPR window showing me that it looks okay and it's fast so to me this was the way to go um, you can see I haven't even cranked up the samples in this very much it's still I would I would probably go 240 actually on this and 360 on there if I was serious about this <coughs> And again, if I didn't, if I still couldn't figure out what was creating all this noise, I would just do the override um, and crank up and uh, scale my samples on whether it's the refraction or whatever to figure out how I can get this thing cleaner. But already I'm looking at this and it's like my volumetric lights are super clean and we'll go into that stuff later, how to make them noisy and cool looking. And it's just all this awesome stuff you can do yes it's going to take maybe a little bit longer but man the renders when you're done look so clean and they just look good and the animations look great and the motion blur looks fantastic and we'll show more of that if you guys enjoyed this stream so um just want to say thanks to yosef and to nick stuff for dropping by for a bit and w1lt and anyone else that joined us thank you for hanging out um, I hope this was informative, and hopefully we can do this soon. Let me know what you guys think if you want more of these things. So I'm going to try to do them more often and be more uh, regular. And last things before I leave, talking about uh, the crash course. The crash course is coming along. I think you guys will really like what I have in store. The pre-production stuff is done, and we are shooting, and we haven't even gotten to the crazy post-production because... It's taking a lot longer than expected, but it'll be worth it, and, and uh, I'm super excited to get it done. So I'll be working on it every day and um, while I'm working a full-time job. So, yeah. Again, thanks for hanging out, guys, and uh, I guess we will see you later. Bye.